Dave Boyd with the Potter Shop Hollow Tree Farm and Portable Sawmill, but I'm not at the tree farm and this isn't my sawmill. I'm over visiting my new friends, uh, Dave and Sky Burdett. He's so important. Yes. Dave and Sky's sawmill is uh, also in southwest Missouri, not too far from me, and interestingly, about an hour's drive from Norwood, Missouri. And they've just assembled this Norwood HD 36, and I came out to just kind of give it a once over and help them get started with it. So, a uh, couple questions. Uh, so, first of all, Dave, what possessed you to do something crazy like buying a sawmill in the first place? Well, I would say what possessed me the most to buy a sawmill is that I've always had a love and an interest for woodworking. So initially being able to build a timber frame, you know, addition to our home. Um, after that, I mean, there's just uh, a plethora of projects that we need to, to get done here on the homestead. Uh, barn for hay, buildings for the animals, um, a building. This will be one of the first buildings, actually, to cover the mill. Um, but eventually, once it's established, then just general woodworking stuff. Uh, different woods for special projects, woodworking. I want to build uh, walking canes, um, all the furniture to go in our homes from uh, tables and chairs and uh, countertops, uh, you name it, bowls. So, you know, the beauty about this is we have an, a, an abundance of woods all around us. And to be able to go out and fell a couple of trees and with the help of the Norwood, you know, we'll have, we'll always be in good, good supply of our own home milled wood. So what made me ultimately choose the Norwood as I looked at, you know, the Norwood and other competitor saws, but what I liked the most about this mill is its ability to scale up, moving from manual to more uh, mechanized ways of getting it done I don't have to purchase a new machine to do that I can just buy the add-ons and if I wanted to at some point switch from manual to hydraulics I don't have to buy the base machine all over again so really I liked that idea about it the most and that's ultimately what made me choose it over any other mill I'm excited about it. Uh, a big reason why we even moved out to land that has a lot of trees is so we could become producers. Given the economic status of our world right now, it seems very important to secure a future and what we can do for our own selves. So this allows us to do that given the coupling of the land and what it has to offer. Uh, the Norwood Sawmill makes us, makes us producers. And I'll add to that on that note, so that we named our land Moth Land, which stands for my own two hands. And so really this fits right in with that um, concept or our goals or our ideals, if you will, um, to be able to produce and make most of what we need, a lot of what we need with our own two hands. And so Norwood, the mill will be a tremendous aid or tool in our toolbox for being able to accomplish that. We have probably only milled um, maybe about three or four trees uh, thus far. Really, I've just been taking my time, uh, as my time and health allows, um, familiarizing myself with the, the details of the mill in preparations for uh, you know the more important projects that we have. I would really like to be able to get it really dialed in as best as possible prior to starting on those more important projects. So after having made a few cuts on the mill, it's had a chance for everything to kind of settle into place a little bit. This is a really good time to back up and readjust and kind of make sure everything is still tweaked in. So let's take a look at the mill itself. Uh, everything is up to tension right now. So Dave, if you want to get that leg guard off, I'll take this one off so we can get a better view of it. Okay, just a little bit of the blade of the tooth exposed. You can feel on the back side, you got a lot of blade over on the other side of that band wheel. And what I like to do is to center the gullet of the blade and the back of the blade on the wheel. So it needs to come out, oh, good eighth, maybe three sixteenths of an inch. So we'll turn it in the direction 
that it cuts while we adjust the tracking mechanism with the wrench until we get it where we want it and then do the same on the other side. So we can look at our handy chart here. We know that we need to turn counterclockwise to move the blade in the desired direction here. So we'll rotate the wrench and also turn the blade by hand in the direction that it would be going if we were cutting. And we'll just spin it by hand a few times, clear around, make sure that it's going to stay there. Feels about right. So we'll check the tracking on the other band wheel, get it the same, and we'll be good to go. So when you change your blades, check your guides on both sides. So we'll push up, and you see there is no give to that at all. Coming down, a little bit of clearance. So that blade is going to be scraping against that guide the whole time, which you really don't want. The guide doesn't normally contact the blade unless it's trying to control the blade from diving or climbing out of a cut. So we're going to loosen both. There. You might have seen that uh, ceramic guide pop up just a little. Now we'll tighten the top one. We're going to just push up just a little bit, fraction of an inch on the blade snug it down then push down just a little bit on the blade holding the blade guide on the bottom against it and we're just going to snug it down for right now so when you get just right there's a little bit of clearance above and a little bit of clearance below and that blade will just slide right through smooth as silk And there you go. And of course you need to do the same thing with the other guide as well. Cables that raise and lower the saw head can stretch out a little bit. We need to check those and level the blade and make sure it's cutting right on the mark. Where you rest the tape measure ah, against the cross bump like that and then look at where we are on the blade. We'll do it. So we'll go to 8 inches. To get the proper curve for the blade, the tips of the teeth are bent just slightly in groups of three so you'll have one that's straight one that's bent up about twenty thousandths of an inch and one that's bent down twenty thousandths of an inch and then that pattern repeats measuring to the bottom of the one that's bent down gives you the exact distance between the bottom of your cut and the top of your cross bump okay let's see how it looks on the other side again we're going to the bottom of the lowest tooth and we are reading, uh, it looks like 3 sixteenths of an inch too low. The screwdriver keeps the cable yoke from turning as we adjust it. And we know that the adjusting nut has 16 threads per inch. So we need to turn that nut three revolutions to bring it up where it needs to be. Okay, so we're right at 8 inches on this side and that blade is now perfectly parallel to the cross bump, which is what we need. That's the column on the far right that reads exactly like a ruler. So an inch on the scale is going to be the same as an inch on your tape mesh. Okay. So what you do is you, cal you need to calibrate that. And what that involves is getting it over a cross bump, and we're just going to have get it at an exact height, and then use this handle here to raise and lower it so that it reads on this scale exactly the same height as the bottom of the blade is from the top of the cross bunk. So you have to loosen the small sliding scale first, then we can loosen the main scale, and now we have easy sliding of the main scale, slide it until the 8 inch uh, line is right under that indicator, tighten it down, and now we have our scale calibrated. Well, Dave, that's a nice looking piece of uh, black oak you've got on there, but I think you made a 
maybe a rookie mistake here, and that's the way you've got your your log stops up. Now the, the Norwood log stop has a cleat on it, and all you do is bring that cleat around and lock it back. Now you push that log against it, and it's not going anywhere. I definitely made that mistake. During the last cut, as you saw, it definitely moved on. Yeah, well, especially because you got that rounded part underneath it. I can just see how that the force of that saw blade coming across is going to ride right up and over. And That's exactly you'd be right out there. of control. I, I was noticing some of the, the marks from the mill are at an angle, and that must be where, where it moved on you. And it'll also raise it up a little bit. So that's a good thing to, to watch out for and easy to fix. The other thing is, if you have it all the way down on both your log stops, you cannot, they are right at about seven eighths of an inch above the deck, and you cannot lower the blade uh, more than about one inch above, or less than about one inch above the deck. So you know, no matter what cuts you make, you're not going to be hitting your stops. Not even when I've got a square can't even. Uh, and it might be, you know, six, eight inches high. If I've got a good flat surface here, and I know I'm going to be slicing down all straight through, go ahead, drop these all the way down, get the, get the can up against it, and I go, and I don't have to worry about it. Now in this case, the bark of the wood and the curvature, so your best bet is when you get down to this point, and it might be easiest to do it this way. Have the rollers up just a little bit. Flip the log over. There you go. Now you've got something that that cleat you can bite against. So, but. You will eventually leave these up a little too high and you will put your blade into it. You'll destroy your blade and put a nice nick in the side of that. And it's just kind of like notches in your gun. <laughs> Every time you do it, that just means you had that much more experience. Anyway, that said, I think you said you were finished with this piece? Yes. We can offload that and bring the next piece on and we'll just go ahead and run through a log and make sure everything's working okay. Sounds great. All right. So what, uh, what you've got is a little bit of the fork here, and that's going to make it too wide. So you've got a couple of options. One, you just trim it with the chainsaw, or you can let the sawmill do the tra trimming on it for us. So we just rotate this log so that this side of the fork is straight up, and we make our first pass. It'll slick right off, and we can go from there. Sounds good. If, if you're good for it, uh, have at it. I'll, I'll, Matt, I'll do the clamps. Yeah, I'll stay out of your way. Wow, that is up there a bit. Okay. okay. I got it. You can let go now. It, it'll, it'll stay put. Good. Uh, eight inches of clearance from the, from the blade to the to your. Uh, for your shield. So you don't want to be any lower than eight inches when you make that cut. So we'll probably first cut come down you know, maybe to about here and just slip this part off and then decide where to go from there. We might
On your blade if you feel it right here at how rough it is and I think what we're getting is some buildup of pitch on there you feel that I do so what the problem that creates is it makes drag on the blade and the teeth are bent up and down to give you the kerf so that the blade clears through the cut now you're making the blade thicker it's a rough surface it's going to heat up it's going to drag and there's no way, I don't care how sharp the blade is, there's no way you're going to get a straight cut. It's always going to be trying to flex on you and either climb or dive. And it's worse this time of the year in the spring when the sap is rising because that's what this is, is a buildup of sap on the blade itself. And just maybe a quarter cup of pine saw or simple green, uh, both good solvents, uh, mixed in uh, for every... Uh, for every time you fill your water reservoir, that'll cut through that and it'll keep your blade uh, free of any sap build up and you get a lot more life out of your blade and you'll get straighter cuts. So we're putting this on the bottom? Yeah. Okay.
Okay, well, looked like you and Sky were pushing that mill pretty hard, and uh, I tried it for a bit, and yeah, you're you're well past due for a new blade, and you're cutting post oak, and post oak is notorious for having a, a grain that makes makes a blade want to dive and raise anyway, and you can see this black area here, that's where the blade was getting bound up and uh, scraping real hard against the wood. And you put a level on there and, you know, unless you want to make a teeter-totter, uh, you probably want to cut a little straighter than that. So <laughs> raised bed, something like that, I think will be fine. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's go through a blade change and that'll be a good experience anyway. Let's just go ahead and do this. Every time you change the blade, put your hand on the bearing. Just, you know, palm so, of your hand. Now, does it feel hot or warm? Warm. Okay. If it's so hot that you can't hold your hand against it, then you know that you may Time have a problem. Oh, okay. And uh, generally, I keep an extra bearing in the toolbox just okay. to have it so it doesn't shut me down. They're real quick and easy to change. In any case, they're not sealed bearings, and I, anytime I change the blade, Usually it's a good time to give it a shot of grease. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Just a couple of squirts. It doesn't have to come, you know, gushing out. And that's a good kind of grease gun with the trigger. I like that better than the... Now you're ready to take the tension out of your blade. You'll take probably 10 turns. Alright. Ride back and just hit down with your hand on the blade. And that'll, yeah, this is good. No, harder. Harder, yeah. There you go. You hear that? What that yeah. is is that move the band wheel in a little bit. Now you're ready to take it off. And I you start at the top and clear this because the teeth tend to snag the, the shield. Right. Right up there. Okay. And put your gloves on. That's a different time here, I think. Oh, I did. I just, I, just, <laughs> I just kind of did like this. Oh, good. So. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, if somebody tries to help you, don't let them. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know how to coil the blade okay? No. All right. I saw you do it on the video. Yeah, what we're going to do. Video. I'll do this one. And then, well, you do that one. And we're just going to stand like this sideways to the camera. Okay. So it's just make a, a kind of oval on the ground. Your hands, oh, about shoulder distance apart. 
thumbs pointing out. Now you're going to push down and twist in to make a saddle shape. There you go. Keep going. And down. Oh, wow. Woo! Wow. And then if you just kind of shake it around a little bit, it'll even itself out. Wow. That was... I'd see if I can do that again. That wasn't sure. difficult, but there was an Now let me show you real quick how to uncoil a blade. <laughs> Pull it a little bit apart. <laughs> Stand back, guy. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in the wrist, Dave. No, you, you got to pull it apart a little bit and, okay. and as you talk, gotcha. separate them, separate it out a little. All right. There you go. That's know. a good sound effect. He, he, he's going for distance there. Now pull it back up. And it's the same thing. I like to get it kind of going across the top first. Something else. You notice we've got the, the mill all the way to the end of the track to make it easy to get to. Right. And I put vice grips on it so when you pushed against it to do your uh, your grease job, it didn't push it back. So. I did notice that because I think the last time I did a blade change, I was on the other end. Yeah, you're, you're chasing Stepping her down on. the track. Yes, sir. <laughs> Oh yeah, there you go. Anyway, go ahead, I'll shut up and let you. This is a lot get out simpler. There you go. Yeah, you're getting it through the guides, which is good. Get to that other left hand guide. There you go. And it should just slip right on. Now you can crank some tension to it. Should do it. Now roll it and we'll check it for cracking. Now I want to roll it in the direction that the mill is going to turn up. So there you go. Get it out three or four revolutions here. Now I'm do we're doing a couple things at this point. You're checking it for cracking, which by the way looks perfect. And you're also listening for it to be scraping against the guides. If it scrapes against the guides, stop. Figure out where it's scraping and uh, fix it before you go any further. But you're good. We are ready to put the shields back on and get back to work. That's not bad because if there's one kind of wood that's going to really make you go crossways, postal. it's going to be postal. Yeah.
good chicken coop wood. Okay. Sure. They won't mind. I'm going to keep the fox out. That's right. The last thing is just you might want to take the tension out of the blade, turn off your water feed. And that was a good fish. Thank you good. very much. Oh, hey, on a day like this, how could it be anything but a pleasure? Too much. Okay, well, Dave, it's been a real pleasure. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you very kindly for coming. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. And you got a good handle on it, and you got good help, and, or a good Sawyer, and uh, maybe you'll be good help for a good Sawyer. But uh, come on out when you get a chance, and uh, we'll kick around some more sawdust, too. Absolutely. I'm greatly looking forward to maybe heading out to your neck of the woods for a little bit and kicking around there and helping out with what you have going on. That would be a tremendous benefit uh, for me. So Good for both of us. All right, have a good afternoon. Yes, sir. Safe travels back. Thanks. You too.